Hello and welcome to this episode on kiteboard racing as part of the RYA Racing Rules series. Uh, the focus for this video is on individual racing uh, rather than the relay format and it's intended for sailors who are interested in getting into kiteboard racing and for race officials who are looking to get involved in kiteboard race management. To provide an expert insight and uh, to hopefully help us explain the key differences and adaptations in kiteboard racing, we have International Jewellery and International Race Officer, uh, Marina uh, Sikogu. Uh, Marina, welcome. Um, could you give us a, just a brief background on yourself and, and how you kind of became involved in kiteboard racing? Uh, hello, thanks for the invitation. My name is Marina Psychoyu. I'm an IJ and an IRO for many years. I, but I first went to a kiteboarding event in early 2016 and initially I had no idea what's happening. But I soon understood what I have to look for and now it is just like any other sailboat race, only the, the boats, the kiteboards move a tiny little bit faster. So it is the same things, we have the same rules, but we, we have to adapt them in order to fit the special characteristic that differentiates kiteboards from all the other boats, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, before we continue, I just need to, to clarify that the, the discussion that we're having and the, and the text that are cited refer to the 2021-2024 rules, the, the current rules are going to be in effect for, for a few more months. So we are, we are rather discussing the, the rules for the next quad. The changes are not that critical. They're not game changers. Uh, wherever there is something important, we will mention it. Brilliant. Uh, that's great. So, if we start by looking at what what are the main differences and, and I suppose why we need to adapt the rules in the first place? Well, let's have a look at the a video of a start and it will give us an idea. So we see the, the, the start looks like any other boat start, but in boats, in other boats, sails are on spars and they have a limited and predictable range of uh, movement. Kites are flying in the air and can move anywhere. They are all over the place. And for this reason, we, have, we need to get uh, a three-dimensional application of the same rules that we use for any other boat. Yes, yeah, so that's really interesting. How, how does that um, affect us? Well, the only thing we need to do is uh, add a third dimension in the rules. And uh, for example, take the, the keep clear rule, the keep clear definition, the in, in all other boats, uh, a boat keeps clear when the other, the other boat, the right-of-way boat, can sail without uh, taking any avoiding action. And it's exactly the same for, for kiteboards. But then we have the, the second part of the definition that says that uh, if, uh, if boats are overlapped, the right-of-way boat can change course in both directions. Well, in kiteboards, it's not enough to be able to change course. You also need to change the position of your kite. And that's exactly what we have done with the, with the definition. We just added this third dimension. Okay, so, so practically how, how does that work within, within Rule 16 then? Well, Rule 16 is a Robin Hood rule. It, effectively what it does, it protects the keep clear boat from the right, uh, the right of way boat abusing her rights. So a right-of-way boat has the right-of-way, fine, but it's not allowed to, to change course without giving opportunity to the keep-clear boat to keep clear. In kiteboard racing, 
this is not uh, limited to changing course, but also changing position of her kite. So, so effectively, when when a right of way kiteboard changes course or the position of a kite, uh, she should give the other kiteboard room to continue keeping clear. Exactly, and of course, in order for the limitation to apply, the keep clear kiteboard must have been keeping clear to begin with, and then we have the the obstruction definition, which again we have the same idea. When we have an obs uh, when there is an obstruction in the in the course, an otherwise keep clear boat gets some rights in order not to hit the obstruction and have damage. It makes sense. Uh, the definition of obstruction is something that a boat needs to change course significantly to uh, to pass, but it wouldn't be enough for kites because we need to change position of the kite, not only change position of the, not only change course. And after we change the, the definition of obstruction, we also adjust the, the equivalent rule, which is the rule that describes the, what we need to do when we have an obstruction. It is the uh, rule number 20, the hailing rule. So, when a kiteboard is approaching an obstruction that she has to change course and the position of her kite, she may hail. So that's it. Brilliant. So the you know the way we're looking at it is these you know the, that three dimension just has a little bit of a, you know, an input into um, just tweaking some of those definitions. Um, but what what happens when we actually go racing? What's uh, what's different when we when we're on a race course? Well, it's not that different. It's more similar than what you might think. The main difference is not on the water, but it is on the shore. Imagine you saw the kiteboards before on the on the on the video of this on the start video. You need a lot of open space in order to rig the boats, and this space cannot have tall trees. You cannot have electricity wires. You cannot have beach umbrellas. It needs to be free. And another difference, not so practical, where we need to have a judgment, is that kiteboards cannot be towed. So if we had, uh, I don't know, optimists, we can just put the sails on, put the kid in the boat, tow them to the, to the race course, and no problem, they're sitting on the boat. But kiteboards cannot be towed. So this space that we have, the free space, we need to have conditions similar to the ones that we have in the racing area so that the kiteboards can launch and sail to the racing area. Once they launch, they will get to the race area pretty fast. And from there on, it is practically the same thing. Brilliant. So once we're actually on, on the race course then, um, the, the race course is actually yeah, looks pretty similar to what you'd expect from from normal kind of dinghy or, or yacht racing. Um, so the the course will look um, very much like this, but what you'll notice is there's a an offset mark um, just downwind of the windward mark, uh, and that's just we it's called a protector mark. It's a little bit like a spreader mark, but it's really just to protect the boats or uh, the boards coming in on that port ley line into the windward mark. Um, so we don't get boards going round the river mark um, at 25 or 30 knots and then boards coming up wind at, at 20, 25 knots uh, and getting, getting big crashes. So we have a protector mark which is just downwind of that windward mark. We'll also see there's a, a sort of offset mark to the leeward mark as well. So the um, we have a mark two which is slightly, slightly upwind and then mark three which is um, just offset a little bit. And what that's doing again, it's just spreading the boards out a little bit so we don't get big head-on collisions. Um, there's also, you'll notice that we don't we generally don't use a gate very often in kiteboard racing. And the reason for that is that if we have a gate, then most people would just go around the, the kind of go right mark and head out to the right hand side of the course, and then you do one tack, and it ends up being a really big procession. So by having to make them do at least two tacks, uh, it, it opens up the race course a lot more. Um, but then other than that, 
it looks it's pretty similar. Yeah, and if you're a mark layer, you just you just put marks in the water. It doesn't matter what goes around the marks. It, you just need to make sure that the mark is, is set and it's not moving. And starting a race is also, it, it's the same thing, probably simpler. The starting system is going to be in the rules from the, from the next pod. And there are, a, a few differences compared to the big, to the basic rules, but the all the system all the differences make sense. Yeah, exactly. So for you know, our average our average race time is is about ten minutes or a ten minute target time. So actually, a five minute start sequence doesn't really make sense. Um, so for us, a three minute starting sequence is sufficient. Um, there is no option of using um, Papa India or, or Zulu flags as the, uh, the parity signal um, for a pretty good reason. Um, you can imagine the, the mess if a, a kite board tries to go back to the starting line um, after the start when there's um, kind of 50 or 60 kites going upwind and they're trying to go downwind when the lines are at 20 meters long and you're trying to you're trying to thread the needle between people coming upwind. So of course, quite a big mess. And mess at the start is not going to occur only if, uh, if someone tries to go back after the start, but also if someone tries to stop uh, on the line while the others are preparing to start. Yeah, so a, a kite board uh, generally slows down by, by lifting a kite in the air, so you reduce the power or the pull of the kite. Um, but once, as soon as you do that, the kite board then takes up a lot of space because of the, the different angles that the lines are at and the different positions of the kites. We can't really have that. Um, so there's a change in the rule um, uh, explaining that. Yeah, that's exactly why we we made the rule about it. So the rule says that during the last minute before a starting signal, a kite board that either stops or significantly slows down or is not, or is not uh, significantly moving forward shall keep clear of all others unless of course she is accidentally capsized and this rule overrides the basic right of way and marks and obstructions rule so it, uh, you you can't say that i'm on starboard and i'm stopped on the starting line it doesn't work you are not allowed to do that brilliant so that's yeah that's another example of, of you know little adaptions just because kites you know you can move those kites around that three dimensions coming back in a little bit more so if I'm a race officer, I'm sitting here, I'm kind of listening to this. How, how, you know, we, we get to start, you know, we get, we get that last five seconds, we get the gun, but then how does the race officer know who, who's who? Okay, let's have a look at the video. Brilliant. So that's what that's what a start looks like. But if I'm a race officer sitting here, um, how do I know who's who? Well, it's obvious that you cannot uh, you cannot tell what kite belongs to which sailor. So it doesn't matter when, where the kite is. For both starting and finishing line, the race officer is looking at the competitor and the board. The competitor is wearing a, a competition number on a lycra or on a t-shirt. It's pretty big and visible. It's worn over all other clothing. Then the helmet and the board have a, a nationality flag on them. And the race officer can also see whatever other characteristic uh, on the sailor to help uh, identify. And once they are off the, off the starting line and they start getting more spread, you can link uh, a kite board to a, to a sailor. So it is, it is possible to, uh, to identify with a kite as well. Brilliant. So once they've, once they've gone off the start, um, what are the changes with the, with the right of way rules? So if we imagine we're now going upwind, for example, what are the changes with the right of way rules? Yeah, well, before we go to the mark, the, we cannot, the, our basic right of way rule port starboard, it wouldn't work exactly as it is with uh, all other boats with kites. 
So there is a, the adaption is pretty practical. We define port and starboard according to the to the hand that is to the front, which is the way that I remember using when I was sailing an optimist uh, many many years ago. So it is back to the roots in a way. Yeah, and then another, I suppose, another adaption actually while we're talking about that is is rule thirteen. Um, so the wild tacking rule is is deleted um, for kites because it's. Um, do you want to just explain? Just why that's been deleted, Marina? Yeah, Rule 13 and uh, also Rule 17, they, they, don't, they wouldn't really have a, uh, an application. The, the boats are so fast, the kiteboards are so fast that we cannot, uh, we cannot easily define the, and split the movement in, in slices the same way we do it with other boats. So these rules just, just go. Uh, these rules go, but we have some other rules that uh, that come in because of the the special nature of uh, the different nature of uh, of kiteboarding. And before we talk about the the actual rules, we have to define the the ideas. So we have the the idea of capsized. In normal boats, a boat is capsized when the mast head is in the water. It couldn't apply like this in kiteboarding, obviously. So here we we define the idea of capsized when the kite is in the water or the lines are tangled with another kiteboard's line. And uh, and a second idea which is which is very well linked with the, the idea of capsized is recovering. So a kiteboard is defined as recovering from the time she loses steerage way, so from the time she loses control, until she regains it, unless she's, uh, she's capsized at that time. Capsized, so the kiteboard is in the water. A kiteboard loses steerage way and regains steerage way. Within this time, the, the kiteboard might be capsized. So at the moment that, is, that she is capsized, the moment, the time that the kite is in the water, she is not considered to be recovering. Uh, and also to define it, that's why we have A and B, to make it crystal clear, the kiteboard is recovering from the time her kite is out of the water until she has a steerage way. So when a board, the kiteboard is recovering, is when a kiteboard is capsized and takes the kiteboard out of the water from the moment the, the kite is out of the water until she starts sailing again, she's recovering. Okay, so that's really interesting. I, I, you know, I think this is definitely an example of how the rules have, have you know, changed um, through the experience of, of you know, being involved in, in kite racing. Yeah, absolutely. And let's see how it uh, how this is uh, how this is reflected in uh, in the rule. So, if possible, a kiteboard shall avoid another kiteboard that is capsized or is aground or is trying to help a person or vessel in danger. The the stress here is the if possible. So, when there is a kiteboard capsized, the sailor swimming in the water and the kite a mess floating around, the kiteboard who is going sailing their, her race, if possible, should avoid. But of course, if it is not possible, sometimes it's not, sometimes the kiteboard who is, which is sailing has no other option. But it, this is a safety rule. Yeah, and, and this rule overrides the kind of basic right of way and, and, and the mark and obstruction rules. Well. Yeah, exactly. Like the other, the rule were that we're not allowed to to stop and slow down on the on the starting line. And then we have the the recovering rule, which is it's a bit different. A kiteboard that is recovering shall keep clear of a kiteboard that is not. So there is no there is no excuse. There is nothing. A kiteboard that is recovering cannot interfere with anybody that is not recovering. So when you're in the water and you are trying to, to, 
to bring your kite in the air to start sailing, you have to look around and make sure that there's no one else coming. Yeah, and again, this this also overwrites like the basic right of way and, and the mark and obstruction rules again. Um, so let's let's now have a look at what happens when we we get to a mark. Well, at the mark, the zone is 30 meters, and that sounds a bit uh, a bit bossy, you know. We say the the zone is 30 meters, no discussion. Yeah, but given the speed of, of kite boards, you know, they're moving it. 25 to 30 miles an hour upwind um, and the length of the board is, is about 1.5 meters so uh, three the three boat length rule wouldn't wouldn't work there because it would give you about 4.5 meters so anyone that can do a bit of maths would know that's not not many uh, not much time and it just wouldn't be enough um, so that 30 meters to kind of give them give them a bit more time to to have you know to kind of go around the mark and and to set up for those those rules um, it's worth noting it's still about three seconds um, at their race, pa uh, race pace. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, still not a lot of time. Yeah, it's it's three seconds. And imagine that it is 25 to 30 boat lengths. So it gives you a, a perspective of the, of the comparison of the speed between uh, uh, other boats and, uh, and kite boards. But before talking about uh mark room let's see how overlap works kite boards like james just said are pretty short the board is is about uh, one meter 50 if even if so so the overlap between the hulls is not very common you would see you would you you would see that Usually, we, the relationship within, uh, between kiteboards is a clear ahead, clear stern relationship, which makes things quite straightforward, simple at marks. Uh, the overlap is uh, between kiteboards on the same tack if they're going upwind, and between kiteboards, regardless of which, what tack they are on, from 90 degrees and, uh, and lower. And to take uh, a last uh, point of certainty principle that we have usually in, uh, in match race, if there is a doubt, a reasonable doubt, that uh, two kite boards are overlapped, then we presume that they are not. Why not? Because they are so short that they probably are not uh, overlapped. Brilliant. So then if we look at rule 18 now, um, it's a little bit simpler uh, than, the, than the basic um, rule 18, just due to the, the speeds that the kite boards are, are moving at. Yeah, uh, it, is, it, is, it is quite simpler than the, than the rule that applies for, for other boats. And it, it doesn't apply for sure between a kite board that approaches a mark and a kite, kite board that is leaving a mark and between kite boards on opposite tacks. It applies only uh, between kite boards that when they are required to, to pass a mark, the same mark, and one of them is in the, in the zone, the 30 meters. And it stops applying when mark room was given. So as simple as that. Brilliant. And then if we actually look at, uh, you actually mentioned their mark room. So let's now have a look at, at that and what's different there. Well, that's also uh, simple, straightforward. There is uh, the relationship locks when the first kiteboard reaches the zone. So if the kiteboards are overlapped, the outside kiteboard shall give room to the inside kiteboard thereafter for the whole time until they, they pass the mark. If they are not overlapped, the, the kite board that has not reached the zone shall thereafter give mark room. So whoever reaches the zone first, if they're not overlapped, is, uh, is entitled to mark room. Then, when the, when the kite board that is entitled to mark room leaves the zone for some reason, then 
the counter is set back to zero. The, the rights are lost and we have to apply the rule again. It, it might sound complicated when you see it written in the rule, but it's pretty simple. If you go out of the zone, then you lose all, your, all the, the markroom rights and we have to apply it again with whoever is, uh, is first in the zone. And uh, the, the last, the third part is a, is a safety thing. If you obtain an inside overlap, of course, before any kite board is in the zone, and the outside kite board is not able to give you mark room, then she will not give you mark room. And this is to, 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 to avoid uh, kite boards tacking under uh, a big group of overlapped kite boards that are going to pass the mark, for example. Okay. And, and is that all to, to, to the mark room rule? Well, there is a little bit more. We have, you know, rule 18.4, the one that you are not, uh, if you are on a downwind leg, you are inside and right of way, and you cannot go further than your proper course before you jibe to around the mark. Well, this is extended for tacking as well. So if you are inside, uh, inside overlapped and right of way, and you need to you need to jibe or to tack to round the mark. You cannot go further than your proper course before you do so. Brilliant. So you, you mentioned uh, lowered marks there, but let's let's um, let's see what the windward and lowered mark bearings actually actually look like with a, with a couple of videos. So rule 31 says that a kiteboard shall not touch a windward mark, but they can touch the leeward mark or any other mark. Why? Uh, I think it's, it's actually a really practical reason. So the, the way that the foils are below the water, there is a, you know, quite a long mast, about a metre, and they're just over a metre long mast um, with the foil on the bottom. So it's really just for the safety of the sailors and, and the, you know, they're very precious, the mark layers of the mark itself. And um, it really, the, the anchor line will always run a little bit to windward um, of the mark. And so, if they're struggling to um, struggling to um, make that mark in particular, then it make and it puts them really close to uh, to that anchor line. So, if uh, if they then hit the anchor line, they'll crash, and then somebody behind it, you know, you, you get a really dangerous um, situation. Um, the other reason is that. We, they have to raise the kite a little bit to go around the movement mark just to take some of the power off to allow them to actually turn. Um, so again, it's something it's just links into that to that rule. That's why it's just the movement mark because it's really just safety. Okay, so let's see what happens when someone touches a mark and breaks a rule and it will be the same thing for every rule. So when the kite board breaks a rule, it shall promptly get clear of other kite boards and take a one-third penalty with her hull appendage, which means her foil, in the water. That is more or less the same with, with any other boat, you know, promptly get clear of other kite boards, but only one turn. Yeah, uh, uh, only one turn really make, makes sense. The speeds that um, they're racing at is actually a two-turn penalty would be would be too harsh, um, really, for the the speeds that the, the kite boards are moving at. I suppose that really then raises the question: Is a one-term penalty good for all breaches of of the rules? Well, it's it's the same with the, with all other with all other boats. If you cause the injury or damage, or you gain the significant advantage, then one turn penalty this the turn penalty is not enough for kite boards. Also, if you cause the tangle, the, ter the one turn penalty is not enough. We'll talk about the tangles afterwards. But there is another idea here. Often, the kite board that broke a rule, they take one turn penalty and continue sailing, while the other kite board may end up swimming and, and wrapped with her lines and her kite and will be unable to finish the race. Or, will lose a lot of time before she can uh, recover and with a short time of the of the race if you lose three minutes to 
to get uh, to get back uh, sailing then you have lost you you are from first to last so the basic rule is a bit unfair that you know we, we broke a rule i take a one-term penalty i finish the race no problem and the other one lost the race is left swimming and and nothing more so additional to the to the injury the damage and the tangle for which the one turn is not enough causing a significant disadvantage to the other kite board is also uh, also makes the the one turn penalty not enough and you will need to retire exactly so you mentioned you mentioned tangles there as well um i think it's it's quite difficult to, to define what a tangle is um, because there's so many there's so many ways to to kind of tangle the kites up. Um, that's kind of how how I see it. What 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 are your thoughts there? Well, it is it, it is difficult to define it because it, there are so many different uh, ways that you can end up, and it will it can be two or more kite boards and you can get in a tangle that you manage to to get out at some point and this was uh, this was not a very easy call to make for for judges and we needed to make the call pretty often because in the in the past it was possible for a for a kite board who ended up in a tangle and it goes through no fault of her own to be entitled to redress. This is not the case anymore. It has uh, it has changed for the for the 2021 and on rules, but also the sailing instructions for the all the the events that will happen in the post-COVID era have changed the rule already. And it is apart from uh, we expect to. To have a lot less hearings, and the reason for wanting more, more less hearings is the is the COVID implications. But I'm very happy to to get out of the of the judgment. Yeah, and it and actually puts more onus on avoiding a tangle in the first place, rather than going, oh, I'm in a I'm not in a great position. If I just tangle, I'll get redressed. So. I'll do that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a safety thing as well. I think we probably should show an example of what a tangle looks like. Um, I think we've got a, a video just that will show the what a tangle looks like after a start. Yeah, that's a pretty bad uh, a bad example, but uh, it, actually it's a bad situation and a good example of what a tangle is. Yeah, so exactly. You can see from that video that actually that it's really hard to see who caused it. Um, who's affected by it, how many people are involved, and that's just from a, a fixed camera on the committee boat, so you can see why the, the tangles um, being being taken out of the rules, um, for sure. So if we move on now and we look at um, some other kind of relevant rules that are... Yeah, these rules are, are the rules that are left now, with the, because in the past the only, the only uh, rule that was, the main rule that involved the uh, Tangle was the redress rule. So uh, now we we get we get rid of that and we can see the the rules that that still have something to do with uh, with tangle. So first of all, uh, I will start from the last one: protest decisions, Rule 64. So when someone is disqualified because she broke a rule and uh, and with that bridge, she calls the tangle. She gets a squirt called the DCT, disqualified causing tangle. For the first time, it's the same like a, a DSQ, but any subsequent time, the the score is a DNE. So you cannot uh, discard it. It's a similar principle to the to Appendix P and uh, Rule 42 uh, application with uh, the with the other boats. Rule 36. You can rule 36 says that a boat cannot be penalised in a, in a resailed uh, race for for a penalty that she did in the original race, except there are some exceptions. And one of those exceptions is the is this uh, DCT that if you if you are if you 
if you broke a rule and you caused the tangle and you are disqualified for that in one race, you are not disqualified in the resale, but the penalty counts for the as your first penalty. So the next time you will do it, you will get a DNA. Rule 44, we talked about it. If you cause the tangle, one turn is not enough. You have to, to retire. And rule 61, one, informing the protestee. Well, when you want to protest, you have to hail protest in any language that you're sure the other sailor will understand. If there is a tangle, it is very possible that you will be swimming, you will be trying to, to stay afloat, and uh, it will probably be a bit difficult to, to shout. You might not even see where the other sailor is. So, yeah, with all this misfortune, you are excused from hailing protest, but you still have to tell the other sailor as soon as possible. And I think that's all. Yeah, I think so. So, to, to really to summarise the, the the changes to the rules are, are not really that that different at all. Um, you know, really, everything is just an adaptation. There's very few new rules. Um, I think the key point, um, you know, particularly, is, is when trying to understand these changes, is that the the kind of if you understand the the three dimensional um, aspects, and we really kind of think about the kite. Um, when we really consider that a lot of these changes kind of make sense it's just uh, just a common sense thing so that brings us uh, to an end um, for this video marina thank you very much for your time and your insights uh, that you've you've shared with us thank you and see you soon on the water somewhere yeah for sure brilliant well i hope you've all found this video interesting um if you'd like to learn more about uh, kiteboarding and kiteboard racing um, within the uk then a great place to start is the british kiteboard uh, kite sports website um there's lots of information on there about how to get into into kiteboarding um and and the whole the whole range of kite sports um the rya website has a lot of information about the pathway into kite racing and information on how you can get involved in race management as well Finally, to know more about kiteboard racing generally, um, the International Kiteboard Association uh, website has a lot of useful information and, and links to your, uh, if you live outside the UK, your local um, MNA. Um, and that brings us to an end. Thank you very much, and I'll see you again soon.